Super excited to talk to you guys about nutrition secrets to increase your years on and off the course. And I kid you not, this information will change your life as well as some of your players' lives on the course as well as off the course. And this is from research, this is from years of working with people inside of golf as well as outside of golf. So uh, the information will be really valuable to you and you're gonna see that they're not very complicated, uh, but highly, highly effective for you as well as your players. So my time is pretty short with you, so if you guys can hold your questions till the end, um, I would appreciate it. I'm more than happy to stay after to answer any questions. Um, this is the only thing I have to do today, so I can be here for eight hours and any questions <laughs> you want. Seriously. So, with the game of golf, we know that the body is so important, right? So you guys have all heard of the body swing connection. And so I think Sam Sneed said it best in regards to your game.
And then the very, very top of the food pyramid is going to be supplementation. What supplements are going to be really effective with players? So since 2004, I've worked with a lot of different types of players to the elite level to, you know, the amateur. And so I've researched a lot, but I've also had a lot of practice in terms of the clinical setting and what works and what doesn't work with your players and how you can utilize that. So let's talk about the hydration part. So your body's approximately the same percent water. Muscle is about 75%. Your brain is about 75, 80% water. So very, very important for your players as terms of a foundation for their nutrition. So in regards to, let's say, strength, the reason why I have this bench press photo up here is that there was a study done in the Old Dominion University. And what they did was they took subjects and they tested their max bench press, right? Their 1RM. And then they dehydrated them in a sauna for uh, whatever it took to decrease their body weight by 1.5%. So if we just easy math, 200 pound person, player, that's about three pounds. That's easily lost on a hot, humid day uh, when someone's playing golf, sometimes double that. And then what they did was they dehydrated them, they retested the bench press, the bench press went down, and then they hydrated them back to their original level, and the bench press went back up. So the application to this to our players is that Oftentimes I hear, well, I hit the ball great on hole one, but then as I get to hole 18, my distance drops off. And it depends on the person, but that's a common theme that I see. And so what this study shows us is that maximum strength goes down with dehydration. And remember, it's only 1.5%. So it makes a massive difference if you can keep a player hydrated on the course. So in terms of yards, right, because the theme of this conference is yards and years. Now the other part of it is from a musculoskeletal standpoint. So whether you're a medical professional or you're a fitness person or you're a golf pro, it doesn't matter. We have to keep our players healthy. I want my players to be able to play well into their 80s uh, and, and play well without pain. And one of the things we do know is if you look at the discs, right? It's the nucleus propulsus in the middle of the, uh, sorry, annulus fibrosus in the center is nucleus propulsus. And so, we know that low back pain is probably the number one musculoskeletal issue for players. And when you are properly hydrating, the discs imbibe overnight and you wake up about half a centimeter, a centimeter taller in the morning. So you're prophylactically preventing low back pain over the long term with hydration. As well as synovial fluid for your knees, your shoulders, most of your joints. A quick story, I think it was 2006, it was at, I think, maybe the or second, or maybe the first World Golf Fitness Summit, and I remember Greg Cook's assistant came up to me and said, Rob, Rob, I gotta stop you. I go, you don't know who I am, I'm Greg Cook's assistant. I didn't have time to watch your video, but I just followed your hydration recommendations, and I had low back pain, knee pain constantly, and my knee pain went down about 50%, and my back pain, like 70% resolved. And I didn't change my training, I didn't change my eating, all I did was water, because that's all I could watch of your videos. So it can be just as powerful as that in terms of water. There's a number of other reasons why water can be so effective from a hormonal perspective to all the way to the musculoskeletal perspective. But uh, these are the two big ones I wanted to bring up. So how much water is important? Half your body ounces of water a day. So if you're a 180 pound uh, player, then you can bring 90 ounces total for the day. Uh, if your metric system kilo basically works out to about a liter per every 30 kilos. So again, if you're this 180 pound player, you're going to be uh, basically drinking about three liters per day. Okay, that's just day in, day out, not when you're playing and then you can just do whatever on the other day. Remember, hydration starts when you're not on the golf course. So you have to do this on a daily basis. This is for just proper function, brain function, for the muscular system as well. So 25% should be consumed first thing in the morning. So just to make the math super easy, let's use a 200 pound person. Half of that, okay, total for the day is 100. So you're gonna be drinking 25 ounces first thing in the morning. So for me, I don't, I'm not 200 pounds, but I drink automatically, I drink one liter right when I get up in the morning. That's my standard, standard operating procedures first thing in the morning. Drink that. First thing, go to the bathroom, do my business. Then I have my espresso 
or you have your tea or whichever. That's very, very important because you've woken up in a dehydrated state, so you want to start the hydration process right away. Most people like to weigh themselves in the morning because they weigh heavier and lighter. Lighter. Lighter, right? Now, 50% of your intake should be during the round. So you should be educating your players. Look, if you have to drink 50 ounce, 100 ounces total for the day, 50 ounces should be in your bag. Or you should have a canteen that is roughly around 25 to 32 ounces, and you should fill that up twice on the course. That's standard when they're playing. 25 ounces, the remaining should be consumed in and around meals. Um, you can just distribute that. Obviously, we don't want to drink all that right before you go to bed because you're probably going to wake up having to pee. Celtic Sea Salt. I don't get paid by them, but I like their salt because it's been tested to have over 80 trace minerals. You put one pinch, so whatever can fit between your thumb and index finger, you put that for every liter. If it tastes remotely like seawater, you put 20 times too much. All right? <laughs> Doesn't want to, you know, want more, not better. So you put a pinch, and that is your natural electrolyte. You do not need sports drinks. I hope Gatorade's not here, but you do not need sports drinks because you're getting a ton of sugar, right? And you're getting all the additives, brownie, vegetable, color dyes, you name it. And really, the electrolytes are not enough. Uh, believe it or not, they've done a study where they've had exercisers exercise for a certain amount of time and collect their sweat, and they analyze the sweat, and what's the most predominant electrolyte? Sodium. Sodium. Okay, you ever taste your sweat? It's salty. So that's why you want to use salt. In severe cases, if you don't, don't have Celtic sea salt, just use regular salt um, if someone especially is cramping on the course. Bananas are probably not going to do the trick. So, we talked about hydration and water. Okay, half your body ounces a day, pinch of Celtic sea salt for every liter. Now we got to go about the food. Whole foods are very, very important because that's that male tier foundation. So with whole foods, what you have to realize, it's all about blood sugar. So when I put this slide up, Automatically, you're thinking, okay, someone's heart rate, right? So up and down, that's a good thing. Well, when we're talking about blood sugar, we don't want it to be up and down. Because basically, what you end up being is you've been on the roller coaster of blood sugar. That's what I call it. And so that can be caused by the inappropriate foods you're eating, too many carbohydrates, the wrong type of carbohydrate. But this is a very, very stressful event to the body. Now, we typically think of roller coasters being fun, but for the body, it's really, really stressful because as you go and spike your blood sugar really high, then insulin has to come up to try to manage that, and you do it too often, then you become insulin resistance, what we call. Now, as blood sugar peaks, there's always a valley after that. So the more extensive the peak is, the further the valley is. And as you drop down through that valley on that roller coaster, that's when you get symptoms. It could be you're lightheaded. It could be you know, you're feeling your hands are shaky. Uh, some people are hangry, right? They're hungry and they're angry at the same time. They're moody. They get pissed off after they hit a bad shot. So all these things can be affected because of the lack of blood sugar control. So with blood sugar control, it all starts with breaking the fast. So just like I talked about your body's in a dehydrated state, your body's in a fast state. Now I know probably half you are like, well, there's this thing called IF, intermittent fasting. Um, if you want to read more on that, you get the book, okay, plug. Um, I've been playing around since 2010, um, and it's, it's a tool, but for most players, probably not a good idea. Um, with breakfast, remember, you're breaking that fast, and within research, they call it the second meal phenomenon, and what that basically means is that they've took, taken subjects, and they give them one group breakfast, and the other group no breakfast. What ends up happening is that their glucose control after lunch, which is four or five hours later, is drastically out of control. So there's over a 70% better glucose control with those that eat breakfast. And if you eat the right type of breakfast, it's even better. So that's why the breakfast part of it for your players is so important. Because golf is so different because it's played for four to five hours, whereas basketball, you play for an hour and a half, two hours, you're done. So it's a totally different beast. So when I talk about blood sugar control, you know, some people say, oh, my BFF is Mary's in, in Connecticut or whichever. Well, your BFF 
for blood sugar control is what I call your PFM. It's your proteins, your fats, and your fiber. Very, very critical to help control your blood sugar. Hands down, this will change your hormones. It'll even change your sleep patterns with breakfast. I've seen that happen. Um, it'll change even uh, musculoskeletal pain. That's how powerful this is. So think protein, fats, and fiber. So in regards to the first part of it, the P, the protein, the root word protein is proteos. It's mean of primary importance. So whenever you're loading up at a buffet or whichever, think protein first. Whether it's chicken, eggs, or fish, or smoked salmon, or whatever it is, that's of primary importance for a number of different reasons. So when we're talking about your brain, the brain is obviously the captain of your body. So we want the brain to function efficiently. And what we do know is that the hormones for your brain, not your brain, but your brain, is the neurotransmitters. So real quick overview of the neurotransmitters. So when we talk about the neurotransmitters and the effects on the body, we talk about one of the primary ones is dopamine and norepinephrine. It's sort of your natural caffeine maker, like your coffee maker inside. You do have that, you don't have to always wear the Starbucks. The other one is gamma butyric acid, GABA for short. It's a sort of a sedative, so maybe some of you use the GABA supplement, and that might help you to calm down, relax, that sort of thing. Uh, the other one is the endorphins, so natural painkiller, and then we're talking about serotonin, which a lot of you probably know about. Um, it's the natural mood stabilizer as well as a sleep promoter. Just remember, all these neurotransmitters need a foundation of amino acids. And amino acids come from not carbohydrates, not from fats, but it comes from proteins. So that's why you need to get enough protein in your diet in order to make the neurotransmitters. Especially for our players that need to have energy, uh, you have to have that foundation. And we'll talk about um, the branch amino acids and how that affects brain function, especially on the course where you can try to maximize that in terms of more of like a, um, a rifle approach versus eating protein for like a shotgun approach. Uh, the other part of it is joint pain. So again, we want longevity out of our players. So have you guys ever heard of glucosamine sulfate? Anybody? Yeah, so everybody's, most people shaking their head. So there's research showing that glucosamine is food for the joints. Uh, it's technically called a glycoamino glycan, GAGS for short. But if you break that down, glycoamino, right? So you need the amino acids for joint production. So that's why there's such a huge boost in terms of the collagen, peptides, proteins, that sort of thing. Um, glycine, for in particular, is one of those amino acids that helps with collagen production. But you need the protein in order to get food for your joints. So if someone is following a vegan plan for the last two years, but they're starting to complain of joint pain, and you've cleared them of all sort of musculoskeletal issues from your medical person, well then you got to start looking at what they're putting in their body, or maybe what they're not getting in their diet. I love cow. I love steak. I love protein. And the reason being is it comes down to getting all the nine essential amino acids. So whenever you eat a piece of chicken or fish or meat or pork or whatever, you can get the nine essential amino acids. Now from an ergogenic perspective, so sports performance enhancing effect, we look at the BCAA content, so branch amino acids. So they've done some studies, uh, Lauren Cordain talks about how they took a thousand calories of meat. So it could be shrimp, fish, chicken, egg, whatever, and then a thousand calories of <coughs> grains. And what they've shown is that with a thousand calories of meat, it has about 33 to 34 grams of BCAAs, whereas a thousand calories of grains has about five, maybe six grams of BCAAs. So hands down, your, your meat makes the meal, basically, in terms of BCAAs. So very, very important for uh, an ergogenic uh, repair process, as well as there's some brain function benefits, uh, and, as well as some other ones too. So fats, so fats can be very, very powerful. Now with fats, I don't want to get too technical in terms of the chemicals and everything else, but with fats, the classification is super basic. So anything at room temperature that's solid, or solid room temperature, you look at the butters, the coconut oil, uh, those are all saturated fats. And then if you look at the olive oil, those are liquid room temperature. 
those are the monounsaturated fats. Uh, and then the polyunsaturated fats are our fish oils, or it could be, which are the omega 3s, and then you got the omega 6s, which are mostly nuts and seeds, but you also get the vegetable oils in there as well. Uh, the only thing that could be concerned with this is cooking. So if you heat these up, they go rancid, and then they're a bad fat. So you do have to be careful that. So, you know, sunflower oil, corn oil, so you know those are very unstable oils where you really want to stay away from them because they're very heat sensitive. So what I want you to know about fats is this. With fats, what's really important to know is that it's impact on blood sugar. So if you, have you guys ever done a glucose tolerance test? Okay, you have to go there, fast it, you drink this nasty orange concoction drink, 50 grams of glucose, it's like syrup basically, and then they test your blood sugar. Well this slide, what it's showing is, it just basically tests the insulin level. Well we know that as glucose shoots up, insulin is that hormone to take that blood sugar somewhere. It takes it to your liver or it takes it to your muscle cell if it's empty where they can store it. Now what they did with fat is they loaded it with fat and then they looked at their insulin response. And literally it flatlines it, the flat tolerance test. So that's why with fat consumption, it can be so important towards stabilizing someone's blood sugar. Need to do that, especially for a player, because they're playing for four to five hours at a time. The other part of it is hunger. Uh, the one thing that I always am trying to do is trying to decrease hunger during a round, because I don't want a player uh, thinking about going to In and Out or pizza or whatever. I want them to focus on the task at hand. So that's where fat can come into play to really deal with hunger. Uh, I put this slide up here is because this is just uh, a slide of a, a, of a cell. So you can leave, see there's glycolipids, uh, but one of the things that's in there is cholesterol. So every single cell of your body has cholesterol in it. It also has some proteins in it, and it has some fatty acids in, in it as well. Typically, most people I can see in their brains are always recommending a lot of meat and fats and all these kind of things, so that well, that may be partially true, but the whole cholesterol heart disease uh, theory, hypothesis, that would be me lecturing for probably at least four hours to give you a proper explanation of that. So I'm not gonna do that, but what I am gonna tell you is cholesterol is very, very important for a number of different reasons. I wanna point out your hormones. So it looks super complicated in terms of what this entails, but what I want you to realize is that with your hormone production, so whether it's your female, obviously what makes a difference is estrogen versus a male has more testosterone, right? Uh, if you are a person that has lots of stress, which no one has stress in this room, right? Like zero, nothing, right? Yeah, we all have stress, right? Some people more than others. Some people tolerate more than others. But what you have to realize is this. So over here is cortisol. So with cortisol, one of its many jobs is to deal with stress. So whenever you get stressed out, you're on the road, traffic, or your boss is yelling at you, or your kids are driving you nuts, they want to let your bike. My youngest son is texting me every couple of hours. I found a Saunders bike. It's for sale, 650, it's an side. Can we go get it? Uh, so, you know, you have all these stressors. So cortisol, one of its jobs is to help you deal with the stress. Now, the sex hormone part of it is this. So if we go over here, testosterone is for a male and estrogen is for a female. So all these things come here to make cortisol, this thing come here to make estrogen or testosterone. Now if you go up the chain, I like to always go upstream on all these chemical reactions and everything. You have B5 is necessary, acetylcholine is necessary. Guess what? Cholesterol is necessary to make your circulating which is the mother of all hormones, which can go either here or to estrogen or testosterone. <coughs> so the whole point of this is that when you're in stress or you need to make more hormones for your menstrual cycle or a guy needs to make more testosterone, you need cholesterol. It's the foundational ingredient to your hormone production. 
And if you look at any sort of molecule of cholesterol versus testosterone or estrogen, any other hormone in your body, they're very, very similar in structure. So you need cholesterol for your hormone production. And oftentimes in the labs, what I see is people that have high amounts of stress, what happens to their cholesterol level? It's gonna go up. Your body's a lot smarter than you are. So when I'm talking about increasing your proteins and your you know, meat and your eggs and your fish, of course I always want you to try to get your high quality protein sources. So in terms of uh, grass fed meat, uh, wild fish, organic chicken, uh, that's really, really important. Um, I, I see Monica who reminds me when I spoke in uh, Colombia uh, way back and I was talking about grass fed meat, you don't want to get grain fed meat. And, all of a sudden, like all these faces were looking at each other, like, what? Like, what is? And this translator had to stop me and said, hey, um, they don't know what grain fed meat is. We only had grass fed meat in Colombia. And I was like, really? They go, maybe we should move here. <laughs> um, but they don't know what grain fed meat is. That's an American thing, right? To fatten up really fast, sell them, blah, blah, blah. So it does make a difference in terms of the quality of the meat. So that's why shop for the quality of meat. So fiber, this is the, sec the third part of the PFF, right? So proteins, fat, and then fiber. So fiber, fiber, fiber is really important. Now most people think of fiber and they think of, well, it's gonna help me go poop, right? So these are my two boys, this is a while ago. They're 13 and 15 now, my 15 year old's taller than me, but they think they're hotshot surfers now. And um, I just put this in a kind of humble a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but they're a hoot, they're funny. But typically people think, oh, they think fiber, they think what? Metamucil, right? Orange concoction drink, little poop. What I need you to understand about fiber is this. There's two forms. So we have insoluble, we have soluble. So insoluble is basically the sort of broom that kind of sweeps out the intestinal wall. So it helps people go poop, right? Now the soluble form of fiber is something that's being able to break it down. So insoluble, your body can't break it down. But soluble has been shown to help increase short chain fatty acids, helps feed the, the gut flora so as a prebiotic. But what I want you to get out of this is this. One is that it increases tidy. So remember, we're after trying to prevent our gut from being hungry. So that's why when you add fiber to the mix, it sort of makes it this viscous concoction. So it's sort of like you're getting a slow IV drip of blood sugar for four to five hours. That's what's really important. Um, the other part of it is that it decreases gastric empty, which also contributes to that sort of IV slow drip. We don't want it to be like straight on into the system. That's when we're gonna cause that roller coaster of blood sugar. So that's where fiber can be really, really uh, good for our players. Now in terms of fiber, I would always prefer veggies. Veggies first, because people, I don't like it when people say, oh well, you should eat fruits and vegetables. Because what do we know the difference between fruits and veggies? Sugar, Sugar, right? So I've had players come to me and they're like, I'm so tired all the time. I cannot get to my workouts and I feel tired. And I see in the food journal they're eating half a watermelon at a time. Okay, or like a huge bag of grapes. It's too much. So I'd much rather people have their fiber from veggies first, then they go to the fruit. And we'll talk about how we're gonna combine that a little bit. Um, and then grains. So people say, well, Rob, I'm getting all my grains. Uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of fiber from that as well, whether it's a cereal or other grains. And really what we have to ask ourselves is, do golfers need lots of grains? Do they need them lots of grains? Because for four to five hours, they have to have energy, right? And you get your energy from glucose. Yes, that's partially true, but we have to be careful with the research that we look at. So, Gleason and Endall, University of Birmingham, they did a study with endurance athletes. They run for two to three hours, so pretty close to four to five hours. And they're saying, well, these guys, they need lots of carbohydrates. And with this particular study, they said that these uh, athletes need up to 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilo. So if you take, let's say, someone who's 70 kilos and you multiply by 10 grams of carbohydrates, that's 700, right? Easy math. But then you're kind of like, well, Unless you measure out your food or whatever, you don't really know what 700 grams of carbohydrate looks like. So 
let's say a cup of white rice is about 50 grams, okay, roughly. Yeah, probably off a little bit by that, 40 to 50 grams. Well, when you calculate 700 grams of carbohydrates, that's a lot of rice. It's not three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It's 15 cups of rice a day. That's a lot of rice, and I'm Asian. <laughs> I don't eat that much rice. Okay? So the thing is that what's going to end up happening is if you take that research and say, well, they exercise for two to three hours, I'm exercising for four to five hours, I should be eating this many carbohydrates, you're basically going to get a player that's going to be fat. Okay? That's the first thing. Okay? They're just eating too many carbohydrates, and that insulin's going to store that carbohydrate somewhere. And because they're not burning all of it off from the liver muscles, it's going to go to where? Fat cell. That's why with people that are 900,000 pounds these days, the body will find a way to store it some way. And then the other thing is for performance, you're going to be put on that roller coaster of blood sugar. So it has a huge impact hormonally, structurally, a number of different ways when you over consume carbohydrates. So the point of that is that really it's all with your carbs is activity dependent. So if you have a player who does play three times a week and is planning to run a half marathon in the next three months, then yes, on the days that they run, they're gonna have more carbohydrate consumption. But on the days that they play golf, they're probably gonna be using the PFF principle, protein, fats, and fiber, to keep their blood sugar nice and stable. So on the course, so we talked about generally breakfast, PFF, so on the course for review, what we want to make sure we do, every single player, again, they should be drinking 50% of their total intake. So we take that 200 pound player, cut in half, that's 100 ounces for the total day, so 50 ounces should be during the round. That should be the goal to finish that during the round. Remember, this is powerful, salt, okay? It's not just only for the electrolytes, but if you get the right amount of salt, um, that will also help your stress response and also helps indirectly with digestion long term as well. So there are lots of other benefits to that. Also, the other thing that I want you to know is that we always talk about blood pressure, high blood pressure for, for males. But if you do work with females, one of the biggest problems that I'm seeing that's been underdiagnosed is low blood pressure. Because oh, we always think, oh, high blood pressure problem. Well, low blood pressure is just as much as a problem. So if you have females that have low blood pressure, one of the first things you have to do is increase your salt intake. You have to, because what ends up happening is they don't have enough blood pressure to go out to their extremities, to their hands and feet, to their brain. So they start to have brain functioning issues, low cognition, they always have what? Cold hands and feet. So if their blood pressure is low, if they get a checkup, make sure you increase their salt. There's other reasons why, but that would be the first one to, to look at. Again, PFF, so if you establish it with breakfast and a PFF breakfast, you want to continue that trend during the round. So what I love to do is I love players to go with beef jerky. Um, it's horrible, it doesn't melt, um, it's salty, right? So it helps replace some of the electrolytes. Uh, it's not heavy on the stomach. Um, and again, because it's just dehydrated meat, you're getting a decent amount of BCAAs uh, from the beef jerky. Um, seeds. Seeds are really, really good in the sense that they have lots of fat, fiber, and protein versus nuts. Um, they're much different in that capacity because nuts don't have much protein. They're mostly fat, um, but seeds have a lot of fiber, uh, fat, and protein. Go Raw is a really good company out of San Diego, um, and they have sprouted pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds with Celtic sea salt. They're super crunchy, salty, um, really, really good for players to use on the course. Nuts, obviously, would be an option. Um, if you can, get them to do some veggies, carrot sticks, celery. I know some players may not do that, but that's, that's helpful because, again, that's the fiber intake that you can increase. Um, fruit would be last on my list, so just be careful with that. The most common fruit eaten is what? Bananas, right? Uh, if they're eating four bananas during a round and they say they're tired, then what you want to do is add some PFF to that. So whether it's beef jerky, seeds, nuts, and oftentimes that'll prevent it from going up and kind of going slower up in terms of blood sugar. And oftentimes that's a trick, or you may have to take out one of the bananas. 
I want to kind of give you sort of an idea of what this should look like. So this would be a day of uh, morning uh, golf. So in the morning, 6.30 a.m., hydration, 25% of total water intake. 7 a.m., breakfast, Denver omelet, ham, peppers, cooks and butter, coconut oil. I have bacon here in bowl because that's something that you're going to have to experiment with. Real quick story, when I started studying, researching fat, I was like, okay, I have free for all, I'm gonna eat my fat now. So I fried a whole pat of bacon in a skillet, took it out, whole five whole eggs, fried it, took it out, half a cabbage, put in the lard, fried it, and ate everything except for maybe two to three pieces of bacon. I normally would eat every two and a half, three hours at that period of time, 15 years ago when I was training really hard for competition. I didn't eat for eight hours, seven, eight hours, huge. That taught me a lesson, holy cow, you increase someone's fat, they just don't get hungry. So that's where you may have to experiment with bacon. So if a player is saying, oh, I'm so hungry by the time I get to like the third, fourth hole, and they're having three whole egg omelet and one piece of bacon, increase to two to three. So that's where you may have to fluctuate and play with that. It doesn't have to be bacon. If they're like scared of bacon or whatever, it could be avocado, it could be added butter to their meal, whatever that is. Um, they're in the round, 8.30 to 12.30. They're playing golf, BCL, double A's, with a pinch of kelp and beast golf, snacks. This is what I would do with my player. Okay, we'll talk about the BC double A's when we get to the supplement section. So hold that question. Post golf, white rice, chicken breast. Yes, with golf, you do deplete glycogen to, to a certain degree. Will you deplete it as much as you did an hour of spin or, I don't know, crossfit workout for an hour? Not really. So if you have a player who's overweight that needs to lose body fat, lose weight, then X the rice. If you have a junior who's underweight, that's 130 pounds, 6'2", and soaking wet, then double the carbs. Make sense? So you just play around in that sense. Um, 4 p.m. snack, apples, almond, um, and then 7 p.m. you just PF up again, black and salmon, steamed asparagus, and then another snack is optional, tuna salad, with seven or six. So this is an idea of the plan for morning golf. I'll let you guys take pics of that if you want. Okay, so afternoon golf, the difference is this. Hydration the same. Breakfast, the difference is you take out the bacon because we want them to actually eat frequently. So they might just do them omelet with some strawberries. So at 10 o'clock they have a small snack, turkey, lettuce wrap, maybe avocado if they need it, hot sauce. And then lunch, herb roasted chicken, I would prefer the thigh because we want more fat with that particular player to last them a little longer. A green salad, um, and then avocado again if you, if you need this. And obviously this is something if you have a touring professional, you don't want to do this next week. You want to experiment and do this for two to three weeks at a time to figure out, okay, what are they going to be doing like I have a guy that's gonna be starting Q school and so we're messing around with his numbers and his food. Um, I'm not having measure food, I'm just saying, okay, well let's have you go with another piece of bacon. And he goes, okay, we'll do that. Um, they play golf one to five, again, BG double A's, don't take sea salt, their snacks, the PFF, uh, beef jerky, seeds, nuts, maybe a little fruit in there. Post golf meal, again, you can do steamed out and white rice, grilled mahi mahi. And then your snack would be roast beef slices, cucumbers. This is really important before bed, especially for your, for your players that have sleep issues. If you cause their blood sugar to go up and down, that will disrupt their sleep. Because what ends up happening is as the blood sugar drops down and you get to low blood sugar, the body will just cortisol and then boom, you're up at 2 in the morning or why am I up? Because your blood sugar dropped too low. Okay, so you don't want to, that's why if you eat ice cream, you drink wine, Drink sh eat sugar, whatever at night, that's usually what disrupts your sleep. Okay, we talked about hydration, we talked about food. Now we're gonna go to supplementation, but again, the supplements only work as good as your foundation of hydration, your food, then you use the supplements. In the book, I talk about five different supplements, so if you wanna read on those, then go get the book. For time purposes, I wanted to sort of give you guys the sort of big bang, okay? What I find works. Um, quite often the best uh, with your players. So I'm going to talk about magnesium first. Magnesium is involved in over 350 processes in the body, so it's massively, massively important. 
What we do know about magnesium is if you crave chocolate, and I won't have you raise your hands if you do, but if you crave chocolate all the time, you probably are magnesium deficient because cacao beans have a high amount of what? Magnesium. Obviously there's sugar involved, but that's one of the things that I find clinically. Second thing, you're constipated. You have a bowel movement every other day. That's a problem. I don't care what any doctor says, GI doctor, whatever, I've seen it all. They say, oh, if you don't go to the bathroom for three days, that's okay, that's your own thing, okay? No, -uh. you have an issue. And usually magnesium is an issue. The other part of it is cramping. So those are the clients who go, oh my God, my calf's cramping. Ah, I couldn't get out of bed. And I had to go to the shower and scratch and blah, blah, blah. Or they're doing, let's say, hip bridges, right? Simple like hip bridges. And then all of a sudden their calves hamstring or their glute cramps. That's a sign of magnesium deficiency. Stress, no one has stress, right? We talked about that. Every time you get stressed out, mentally, emotionally, physically, your magnesium go, they drop down. So that's why this is such a huge mineral that you need to have in your diet. Unfortunately, blood work doesn't do much good. 99% of the magnesium is found in your skeletal muscle, your bones, and your organs. It's 1% is found in your blood. So that's why blood work, if it shows low, you've been low for a long, long, long time. So I like to use a magnesium load chart. Uh, I've been told I got about five minutes left, so if I don't go through this whole thing, you can email me for the magnesium load chart. But basically what you do is you just take magnesium and you load it until you get the poop that looks like the poop evil G. So basically your poop is kind of like a pile of mush or it's kind of loose. Uh, watery. It won't have a laxative effect where you're like, oh my god, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's just you'll you'll have your bowel movement and you'll go, wow, it's kind of loose. So basically, what you do is day one, two, three, one cap with breakfast, one cap with dinner. Day four through six, one with breakfast, two with dinner, and then next day, two and two. So for example, let's say you get to let's say day 16 to 18, you're at three caps, four caps, and all of a sudden you're bowel movements are kind of soft and you haven't changed your diet, you haven't eaten out or anything, at that point, that means your body has had enough magnesium. Because it's a mineral that's water soluble. So it's like if you take too much vitamin C, it just flushes your system, okay? But it's not gonna have a laxative effect. This is the way to find your optimal magnesium level for right now, what I found, because it's individual. I have some people who are five and five and they're like a 100 pound female and then I have like a six three, um, 250 pound guy and he's taking two and two. So it's very individual, okay? It also depends upon, again, your stress level. All right, and sometimes I go up to five and five. I know what people are gonna ask, so I like to use this company, Designs for Health, Magnesium Buffer Chelate. The key thing is if you don't wanna use that company, um, then you can look for this Albion Mineral Time, okay? That means it's a chelated form of magnesium. That's the magnesium that you want. You don't wanna just use any sort of chelated. Albion has the proper chelated form of magnesium, which creates high absorbability with the magnesium. Okay, so BCAAs. Okay, I talked about that earlier, but I want to talk about the supplemental form of it. So leucine, isoleucine, and valine are three BCAAs. What you have to realize is it helps a tremendous amount with soreness. So if I'm working with an LPJ player and we need to really increase their upper body strength, and their power production, one of the problems I come across as strength coach is soreness. And if they're too sore, can they go practice? No, they don't like to be sore. At least the majority of, of players don't like to be sore. So with BCAAs, with this particular study, they took female athletes and they made them squat seven times. And each time they had to squat 20 reps. So they were pretty sore after it. And they showed conclusively that the BCA double group had less soreness over a period of time. And I've seen that clinically. So some guys are like, Rob, I don't know what you're giving me, but I'm, I'm just not sore. And the, the strength coach gave me this new workout. I'm always sore after new workout, I'm not sore. Do I get that effect? Unfortunately, no. But a far majority of my players do get that effect. So that's where you can use that as a way to decrease soreness, especially for some, those of you that are, are strength training your, your players and your athletes. The other benefit is the mental focus okay, that we're talking about. So this is talking about the tryptophan BCAA ratio. So when we're talking about the brain, the brain has what we call the blood-brain barrier. 
It's a protective layer around the brain that prevents any sort of virus or pathogen or any sort of molecule getting in there if it's too big, and it's a protective mechanism of the body. Now, what we do know about tryptophan is tryptophan is the raw ingredient for your production of serotonin. You guys remember what I said about serotonin? What it does for you? Okay? It's a mood regulator, but a sleep promoter, right? Do we want our players to be sleepy on the course? Shake your head no, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want them to be sleepy. I don't want you guys to be sleeping here. So the tryptophan BCAA ratio, what it is is this, is that it's a numbers game. So if you have more tryptophan, it gets into the brain and it makes you more sleepy or tired, which is good at night, but not during a round of golf. When you have more BCAAs, what that does is that outnumbers the tryptophan, and then the player goes, bro, I'm usually kind of faded towards like 15, 16, 17, but I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not getting tired. So the perception is I'm not getting tired because they have the BCAAs in their system. So this is where the advantages of the BCAA comes into play. If we take any sort of protein source, they are a linked chain of amino acids. So it's like a train that's linked together. But if you take protein, they have to be broken down to amino acids and then into the blood. The advantage is this. With BCAAs, they are all individual carbs. They don't need any sort of breakdown or chemical digestion necessary. So what ends up happening is, if you take BCAAs, they've been shown to peak in super physiological doses within 20 to 30 minutes. So if you have a player that's gonna play, you just have them start sipping it before they play around, or training session, if I have someone come in for an hour session, they may start sipping it right as they're stretching, 15, 20 minutes, it's in the blood. So these are the doses I use, like to use. This is based off that soreness study for a workout, four grams minimum. I would sometimes go double, triple that. Okay, and there's other benefits which I don't have time to go into, but that will be the minimum dosage. Um, I like to use this one because they add glutamine to it for other reasons, um, and it's a very clean version. Of, it has stevia and doesn't have any artificial uh, colors or ingredients. So, again, just for review, okay, because my time is going down with you guys, I can't underestimate hydration. If the only thing they'll do is drink more water, awesome, because they're going to feel effects of it within 14 to 21 days. Okay, you can get them to start changing their food, PFF. That's another thing. Just change your breakfast. They'll notice the effects. And then you can use the supplements at the very, very top. Guys, I know it was kind of a whirlwind of information. Um, if you want more info, my book is online at Amazon. Uh, I do talk about extensively hydration for a number of different um, segments, as well as the whole food aspect, and then the other supplements. So if you want to go on Amazon, it's uh, available there. Uh, if you want to get linked up, social media, this is my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Okay. Thank you guys so much for the time. <laughs> Thank you.